So let's start to talk about floor planning. What are the goals and objectives of floor planning? So floor planning is basically a mapping between the logical description, the net list, and the physical description, the floor plan. Okay, what are our goals of floor planning? We want to arrange all the blocks on a chip. We want to decide on the location of the IO pads. We want to decide on the location and the number of the power pads. We want to decide on the type of power distribution. We want to decide on the location and type of the clock distribution. So those are our um, goals for floor planning, and we'll discuss each of these things um, in, the, the in future slides in the course. The objectives, okay, so the objectives are obviously we want to get to as small a chip area as possible to make our design as cheap as possible. But we also want to uh, meet our timing constraints, so we want to minimize delay, and we can only do this if we minimize routing congestion or else we won't be able to finish our detailed route. So let's give a general kind of look at our uh, design. And uh, we can see a typical type of design. Again, this is a type of a periphery or IO area. These IOs, they're really big. They're these types of buffers. And we'll discuss them in a later course. We'll go deep into them, see how they're built and so forth in a later part of the course. But they're really big. As you see, I mean, this is not maybe too scale for most chips, but these things are huge. And so we usually put them in the periphery of the chip. Um, and they have a big space that you can see pretty well and differentiate from the rest. Um, then we'll often make these rings around uh, the inside so the, these IOs which bring in the power can connect to these rings, bring them power, and then distribute the power either by these rails over here that are VDD and ground or by stripes that help us bring VDD and ground closer to the rails which actually connect to the, the cells. Um, we have to have our different blocks inside, these IPs, RAMs, ROMs, etc. And we have to make sure that our power grid actually um, nicely connects to these guys to give them power as well. So when we t t talk about the floor plan, we have to take into account the chip size, the number of gates, the number of metal layers, the interface to the outside, the hard IPs and the macros, the power delivery, if we have multiple voltages, how we're going to clock the thing, and do we implement our chip in a flat or a hierarchical fashion. And we'll uh, discuss all of this in the coming slides. What are the inputs and outputs to the floor plan? Okay, so we have to have, obviously, a design net list. That's what tells us where our gates are, what types of gates we have to place inside. It tells us how many gates we have, etc. The area requirements, we have to know what size we have to make the chip. Now, that can be driven by our net list, by how many gates and what the gate composition is, but it also can be driven by the system where um, we know what our uh, package is going to look like and how much room we have to actually implement this block or this chip. And so they will tell us what the size, what the, the features of the area are, and so forth. What our power requirements are. How how much um, current we're going to be dissipating, what type of IR drop we can tolerate, and so forth, and we'll discuss that a bit later. What our timing constraints are, so that's our SDC file, basically. Um, physical partitioning information, that's if we divide our whole design into sub-locks and we, uh, uh, and we uh, use a hierarchical flow to deal with them uh, separately and make our problem a bit smaller. Um, we have to have trade-offs between die size, performance, and schedule of actually making the tape out. Um, IO placement, well, if we're talking about a whole chip, um, we're going to have to put those IOs, and usually the IOs will have to be put where they should fit on the board or in the package. Um, but sometimes we're going to be talking about a smaller block, and we just have to discuss where to put the pins that actually let us get in and out of the uh, of the block that we're dealing with. Um, macro placement information, this is a good question, and we'll discuss in a few moments how we decide where to place our macros. So those are basically the inputs to our floor planning. What are the outputs? Well, we get the whole area of our uh, of our die or of our block that we're implementing. We know where the IOs are exactly. We know where the macros are exactly. We have defined a power grid and we know what it looks like. We uh, have pre-routed some of uh, the power um, the, the power routes and uh, we know what our standard cell placement areas are if uh, and if we want to we can define all kinds of things in that so let's discuss how we do this kind of more particularly um, at this point uh, the design is ready for standard cell placement and we can apply our placement algorithms that we'll discuss in the next lecture so just a, a, an IO ring um, 
as we saw before, the IOs are often put in a ring around the chip. At least they were when we discussed uh, what we call wire bond design, which we'll, do, we'll discuss in a later lecture. But in general, usually we talk about an IO ring that lets us actually drive the voltage of the IOs, which is often higher than the voltage of the core in a ring, and distribute things around the chip and so forth and be able to hook up to our package in a more uh, short and, uh, and better way. Okay, so um, the pinout is often decided by the front end designers. We know from whoever is making our uh, the, the the higher level, which could be the system or whatever. We know where uh, we actually we know that from this side we want to have our DDR pins, and from this side maybe our Ethernet comes in or something like that. And that's why we'd put our uh, different I/O pads on uh, in certain places. Okay. Um, the problem is that IOs do not scale with Moore's law. Again, we have some sort of machine that has to do this wire bond that has to actually connect this pin to the uh, to the chip. This pin is already uh, much bigger than our wires that are inside um, that are inside the chip. They don't scale very well. The machinery hasn't gotten that much more fancy in in, uh, in the last uh, you know 50 years, and uh, so uh, th th these things stay big. They have high capacitance. They have high um, uh, um, inductance and we have to make sure that they're also driven into and out of the the uh, chip in a very fine fashion as we'll learn later um, so we we use these pins for both connecting signals data signals that go into and out of the the chip but it's also for um, giving bringing bringing providing power to the chip so it's a very critical and very central stage in floor planning the chip um, we'll leave it for a bit and revisit the IOs a bit later. But there is a question of how do we choose the size of our chip. Well, let's look at this type of a, of a chip and we see that we have these IOs around and we have a lot, lot, lot of logic. In fact, it looks like hmm, maybe we won't have enough room and we'll actually want to make our chip a bit bigger. This type of a chip, which is kind of the classic thing we looked at um, when at the very early stages of Moore's Law, is what we know as a core limited chip. because our core is very big we have a lot of logic in here and uh, in fact if we'd make the chip a bit bigger we'd have room for more ios and maybe we wouldn't even have anything to do with them um, the reality is that often in nowadays chips are actually what uh, they look a bit like this we have a lot 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 of these ios we have so many connections to things that are outside our chip that we have all this wasted area in size that we don't actually use for placement we can do our whole placement in a much smaller area so this is all wasted real estate this type of a chip is called a pad limited chip and that's often the case so you need to make sure that you understand that each one of these guys is very expensive and if we add too many of these interfaces we're going to actually become pad limited which means we're wasting a lot of, uh, uh, of area that we're paying for but we're not getting much out of utilization Utilization refers to the percentage of the core area that is taken up by standard cells. So if we look at this uh, picture of a placement over here, we see that there are all these blue things. They're standard cells, but there's a lot of black area, like this whole black area. You see there's nothing there. That means we're not utilizing that area. So utilization is the percentage of the area of the core area that is used by standard cells. And this is a low standard cell utilization. There's a lot of this black area. A starting utilization might be 70%. Why are we going to want to be leaving this type of, uh, uh, of area? Because first of all, we may have all kinds of buffering and so forth to add and resizing, but we also need it for routing congestion. So um, high utilization can make it difficult to close the design. Look, this is a really high utilized area. There's not much black in here. There's not much room to, to change the sizes of certain cells to upsize them. There's not much room to um, actually do all kinds of uh, very tight routing. Um, so high utilization can make it really, really difficult. And it means that when we do optimization um, at later stages of the design, we may have to do all kinds of strange things like route around or, or do all kinds of things, put some sort of buffer that we want to add. Instead of putting that buffer over here, we might have to stick it over here and send our route over to here and back. And then uh, it actually gives us a much worse or at least a much different um, uh, imp imp influence than we thought. So local congestion, and congestion is what me is, uh, is discussing the routing congestion. It can occur with pin, pin dense cells like multiplexers. So if we take, for example, an inverter, if you see there's an, uh, an inverter cell, right, it uh, has some sort of input and output. So that would be, there would be a pin connection here and a pin connection there, and I'd have to bring some sort of a route over to the first pin and a route from the second pin. But a MUX, if we were to take a MUX, right, 
what we have here is we have one two inputs and a selector and an output that's maybe in the same type of size cell we would now have four of these uh, connectors in fact if we would have a uh, uh, four input mux we'd have another we'd have four of those we'd have two of those one of those we would have seven pins on maybe a small area and we have to bring um, routes around that have to connect to all of these and that causes a lot of congestion so um, in things that have multiplexers we're gonna have a lot of local congestion and we wanna, may want to make uh, the placement less dense or the utilization lower in that area we can run something called a trial route um, that will give a kind of a, 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 a an estimation of what our routing congestion is we can see that um, where we expect to have congestion and make changes in the floor plan according to the things we will see in the next few slides. Another um, point that I want to discuss is unique uniqueification. So I don't know if uniqueify is a real word or not, but in our in our field it it surely is a real uh, word. And uniqueify comes from the word unique. We need to have our net list become unique. So a unique net list means that each sub module is referenced only once. Now that's very strange because when we write our uh, Verilog, we write something like this. We write module, and I call it B module, and we have two instantiations here of a module called A module. M1 and M2 are two instantiations of this, and it's really important to write hierarchically because that's how we can use design reuse, make our code more readable, and so forth. What we get here is this B module that we see here, and it has two instantiations of M uh, uh, of uh, of a module one of them we called it a m1 one of them we called it m2 and since uh, a, a module it just has a buffer called u1 we get this u1 buffer inside each of these modules um, that is what's called a non-unique netlist you see each sub module has to be referenced once here we reference the sub module twice we reference a module twice um, we need to uniqueify the netlist. To uniqueify the netlist is to do something that looks kind of dumb. What we do is we take um, this module and we give it a submodule name, and this module give it a submodule name. So we have our s same type of B module, but instead of referencing A module twice, we reference A module one and A module two, and then we make a copy of A module, one that's called A module one and one that's called A module two. We just copy it twice. So each of these instantiations has a one-to-one -one mapping to a submodule. Now, why why would we do that? Well, um, this is very, for a very simple reason. Let's say we did our place and route, and we now we start doing optimization. And for example, we have some sort of timing path that goes through this, and some sort of timing path that goes through that. Now, we decided uh, with our timing that we need to make uh, uh, this buffer bigger in order to meet the timing that goes through here. If we do it on our netlist over here, we make this buffer bigger. We'll also make this buffer bigger because we just have one module in the world. When we uniqueify, now we can make this buffer bigger without touching this buffer. And that's very important. That's why we need to uniqueify our uh, netlist before placement can begin. Um, usually this is done actually inside the synthesis tool. So most netlists that actually reach place and route are done in uh, are unique already. But we have to check this. And uh, usually our place and route tool can uniqueify it if it's not uniqueified already. OK, so let's discuss hard macro placement. When placing large macros, we must consider the impacts on routing, timing, and power. We usually want to push them to the sides of the floor plan. As you can see here, we took our macros and we pushed them to the sides of our floor plan. Um, why are we going to do this? Well, um, placement algorithms like a big, large area that they can play with, as square as possible and without any corners. For example, if we take this area here, we have this macro, and it is pushed to the side, but still, there's this corner. And if we have a standard cell over here and another over here, and they have to connect to each other, they can connect like this, but it'll be hard for them to connect like this because they'll have to route over the, uh, uh, the macro over here. So this is a type of an area where we could have a congestion hotspot. The same would be true if we have these macros over here. And of course, in between them, there aren't a lot of uh, routing tracks. So uh, we, we want to make sure that nothing's put over there. But even on the sides, it may be problematic. What we want to do is we want to push the macros all the way to the sides, make sure we don't have that many of these sharp corners, uh, and make sure that if we do, we, we make sure that things aren't placed around them. Um, after we've placed the macros, we want to mark them as fixed, so nothing will move them, nothing will uh, make them uh, change from our initial floor planning. We have something called placement regions. Well, usually the placement algorithms, as we'll learn, are pretty good, but sometimes 
things happen that are strange. Often it's because of garbage in equals garbage out. So we did something wrong that we didn't pay attention to. And if we're experienced designers, maybe we'll be able to see it. But often we can't and we want to kind of help um, the tool. So uh, we've taken the, uh, the tool and highlighted different areas of different macro of different uh, modules inside. And we see something very strange. You see this purple module? It's placed over here. But there's a little bit over here in these islands that are scattered around and some of it's over here. That does not look too nice. Um, this picture, on the other hand, looks a lot nicer. We have our whole purple module is completely over here. Uh, considering that modules, the cells in modules are mainly talking to each other with local route, that looks a lot better. Um, so how do we do this? Well, we can do it with what we call um, placement regions. There are several types of placement regions. One is called a soft guide, that's the lowest level, which is, it tells the tool, listen, try and cluster these cells together without a defined area. It's kind of a strange type of a, a, of a definition, but it does affect the algorithms that run uh, these things a bit. Okay, we can give it a guide. A guide is a, a bit better. We can define a region and say, listen, this is your region, try to place these cells inside this region, but you don't have to. A region is a bit harder concept. It says, listen, this is your region, all of these purple cells must be in the region or else it's a um, fault. And finally, we have a fence, that's even worse. It says, listen, all of the purple cells are in this region and no green cell can sit in this region. It's only for purple cells. Okay, so that's another type of a placement region. Um, I just want to mention something. Usually this is not a good practice. We don't usually want to or have to um, go in, uh, in, in into the algorithm and change what happens if, if we know what we're doing. So you can tell from this type of a, of, of a picture, we can see something like this. Usually this purple stuff would be over here probably because of two things. Either these RAMs, uh, these are probably RAMs, these hard macros are uh, are part of the purple module and then they, they pull the purple cells to be close to it. Um, maybe some of these IOs also are purple so they pull these cells to be close to the IOs. On the other hand, probably these IOs, they talk directly to these purple areas so they pull these cells over to here. Uh, I imagine that these little islands, they're kind of places that help us buffer and talk uh, between these regions that probably have several paths that move together. And maybe these guys, they uh, some of these rams maybe are also part of the purple region. So it would be better to fix our floor plan if possible than to actually region out and, uh, and make the tool do something that may be suboptimal. Placement blockages and halos. So uh, we often call um, uh, placement blockage a halo. That's an area that we put around a, a macro. So take this RAM, which is not placed at the side of the uh, floor plan, so don't take it as a good example. And what we have here is we have the pins that connect to the RAM. So you see there are all these pins. And usually what happens is we need to um, route a lot of routes to connect to these pins. Well, if we have standard cells that are sitting here in front of these uh, in front of these pin connections, that wouldn't be good because they'd be blocking our routes from going in, possibly even causing shorts. So what we almost always do is we'll put some placement blockage on the area right in front of uh, the pins, maybe even on all sides of the macro. These are called halos uh, because usually they're 360 degrees around it. Um, we can put we can define several types of placement blockages there are other reasons to make places block placement blockages so we can have hard blockages that means that no cell can be placed inside these areas we can have soft blockages which means that listen no standard cell placement will be done inside but once we do optimization and we need to add some sort of a repeater or buffer or something then we can use this area we have partial blockage that means ah listen we know that the the, the module that's going to be put here it has a lot of those multiplexers which are really dense and so we know that we don't want to have that 70 percent utilization here ah, let's do this 50 percent utilization so we can mark this area say listen Partial placement blockage only give 50% utilization inside that area. Um, and we have these halos, which as I said, they're what's around these rams and stuff. They're a, a, keep, a keep away area for standard cells. Um, so hard blockages we'll usually put on all sides of these uh, of these rams and so forth. But when we put the ram or the IO next to the corner or next to the side, what we're usually going to want to do is put soft blockage between um, the the cell and and the sides of the um, uh, of the macro or the floor plan. And the reason being that the placement tool will often not understand and it will put uh, standard cells here that then need to be routed to their friends who are outside. 
that's really bad. So we just put a soft blockage here. If we need for some reason a buffer that just needs to strengthen a signal, it can be used, but that will only be done during optimization. We also have routing blockages. They may be less uh, commonly used, but for example here, we decided that we don't want anything routed in this area, so we can put routing blockage over here. Um, usually we do that per layer, so it might be in a certain layer we don't want any routing um, uh, to be, to be uh, uh, implemented, but that's a, a less commonly used uh, type of a blockage. So to summarize all that, we have some guidelines for a good floor plan. Okay, so this is our floor plan, and we can see a bunch of things. So first of all, as I said, our placement uh, algorithms, they like the single large cell area. Here, they can run their algorithm really nicely, as we'll learn in the next, uh, in the next lecture, and we can get a really good solution if we have this large core area that's uninterrupted. Okay, we want to take our RAMs or our IOs, our IPs, we want to put them outside in the corner, far away, so they don't obstruct this standard cell area. We want to have large routing channels. So let's say we have the PLL over here. It needs to route to here. It's not going to maybe go over the RAM. So we want to just make sure that there's a lot of room in between so we don't have a bottleneck over here that's going to cause all kinds of routing congestion. Okay. And we want to take the pins of the, so we have this block. We would rather put it in the corner where there are no pins in the corners because if there are pins in the corners then we have to get a lot of routes that come over to here we may be pulling standard cells over to there and so forth so try to keep the pins out of the corners looking at this other example um, we have this ram over here it's not very nice because we have a lot of pins that are um, right adjacent to the side of the uh, of the floor plan so if we could we could rotate this by 90 degrees nowadays that's not usually allowed for things such as SRAM usually the poly have to be in the same direction so we're not usually allowed to do these 90 degree rotations but in older design technologies that was uh, we were able to do that but try to keep these pins away from the sides okay and we also don't want to have these constructive channels so these areas if a standard cell over here has to talk to a standard cell over there they're gonna have to go through this channel and ones over here talk to ones over here gonna have to go through this channel it's gonna cause a lot of routing congestion try to stay away from those types of constructive channels um, another thing is that again we have the pins over here we should use blockages like the halos over here to allow a lot of access to the pins without being disrupted by all kinds of standard cells that are placed there